The reading to be found on page 966 is Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Matthew 2, verses 13 to 23. Now, I wonder if you've read or listened to the Christmas events of these last few weeks, and you think, oh, it's pretty good. Or it just continues to knock your socks off. Or are you so familiar with the Christmas and after Christmas story that the incredibleness of the whole thing no longer stirs you and you just take it all for granted? We do need to be careful not just to read the story, enjoy the story, and then fall into the trap of stripping away all the things that have come together for Christmas to take place. Forgetting the amazing things that God did I'm doing it down so we enjoy it, but its effect on us is short-lived. The excitement, the wonder, the knowing what happens next should stay with us. You cannot strip away the angels. They were there. Or the Old Testament prophecies. Or the incredible decision by Caesar Augustus to hold a census which disrupted the whole of the Roman Empire just so that the Old Testament prophecies could be fulfilled. Or well, the journey of the Magi, following by faith, a star that defied all rationality. Or well, even the birth, before the birth, when the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary, tells her she would have a son who would be the Messiah. Or an angel appearing to Joseph in a dream to tell him that he must marry Mary because the baby she was having was the Messiah, was from God. It's a whirlwind of excitement and anticipation. And it's critical that we don't lose sight of the how and the why it all took place. And the reality. Because the world has. It's a narrow version of Christmas that the, the vast majority of people want. Angels, a manger in a stable. Shepherds, a mysterious star to follow, mysterious wise men with gifts from the east, peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's the Christmas that they want, along with acute kids' nativity, uplifting carol services, mulled wine, mince pies and fun, a dusting of snow, 
and the Salvation Army band playing carols quietly in the background. You just want to bask in a warm, comforting glow. That's the Christmas picture that so many people want. Let me tell you, that picture of Christmas isn't real. And this morning as we look at Matthew 2, I want us to think about three pictures of Christmas that I hope will help to keep everything in perspective. So let's have a look at the first picture. This is the man-made version. It's like a, a schmaltzy Disney movie with all the reality of life glossed over or taken out. Like all good Disney movies, it's only loosely based on the book. There's much more to it than these carefully curated and sanitized components of the story. They've been carefully selected, lifted from the Bible, sanitized, polished, and bits thrown away. But the book, the Bible, is all about God and life. Real life. It's complete. And the real Christmas story hasn't finished yet. For most people, Christmas is done <laughs> just by the twelfth night. The tinsel, the glitter, the decorations, the smells and the sound of Christmas have all gone. That's it for another year. No need to think any more about what took place. And the excitement of Christmas for them has been replaced by the mundane sameness and challenges of life. I read in a report that 64% of people surveyed said they suffered from post-holiday blues at Christmas. Triggered more often than by unrealistic expectations and past memories. Or maybe it's because they, were, they hadn't really understood Christmas and have packed it all away. These post-holiday blues end up with people thinking about the future without optimism and without hope. It's amazing really because the real Christmas is all about optimism and hope. The saviour of the world came to those who trust and believe in him. Save him. Have you ever wondered whether Mary and Joseph had post-Christmas blues? They've had the excitement of living through the birth, the temple, the magi, and now things look like they've settled down. And now they're into the trials, the tribulations, and the joys of parenthood. They face living through the uncertainty of the times. Health, work, <coughs> money, security, dirty nappies, and the like. Maybe a cost of living crisis. And the absolute <coughs> uncertainty of living life under the cruel King Herod. Do you think they were now without optimism? and hope for the future. They're now into the mundane sameness of life. But over and above all of that was what they'd heard, experienced, and now knew. Luke 2 verse 19 says this, Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. In all of the stuff going on, she could remember what the angels, the shepherds and the magi had said about their son, Jesus. She had optimism and hope for the future, no matter what came along. And when we remember the real Christmas story, we see God in control and all that he did. Remember all the Bible has to tell us about what follows on from that first Christmas. And then we can be the same. We should always have optimism and hope for the future in and amongst the trials of life. Let's have a look at the second picture around Christmas. If we don't see it and understand it, we'll never make any real sense of all that was going on then and now. We touched on some of it last week when we looked at the Magi. We saw Herod talking to the Magi. And the Magi wanted to worship the newborn king. But Herod had only one thought. This new king was a threat, and he must be killed. It's not a pretty picture, 
but it's vital we see it and always hold it in view. To explain the world and all that's going on, we always need to remember what happened in Genesis 3 and its consequences. Adam and Eve were tempted by the serpent, the devil, to eat fruits from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And by disobeying God, they sinned. And this broke their relationship with God. They were cast out of the Garden of Eden into a life of suffering, death, and into a constant battle with the serpent, the devil, who would do anything to disrupt the plans of God. So there is this, this, this constant battle going on. And maybe you're thinking, isn't this really a bit paranoid? A constant battle between good and evil affecting us? Did he have to mention the devil? It just passed the Christmas holidays. Well, let's look at what the Bible again has to say. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us about the devil coming to Jesus after Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist. Why? To tempt him away from doing what he was born to do. To die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sin to restore our relationship with God. Because God would look at anyone who trusts and believes in Jesus and then not see their sin. But we receive God's mercy and his grace and we're counted as his children. And that's exactly what the devil wants to stop. He doesn't want God in control. So from the devil's point of view, what better time is there to try and stop redemption than kill the baby? Who will grow into the man who will solve the problem of sin and open the door for us back to a close loving relationship with God. In Revelation 12, verses 4 to 6, the Apostle John has given a vision of what was going on. You can read it yourself later on. It's, it's well worth going and having a look at Revelation 12, verses 4 to 6. There's an image in that of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, being born out of Israel. And the devil standing in front of the mother, ready to kill the child, the moment that he's born. But her child is snatched up to God and his throne, to safety. And the devil is stopped from having his way. So that's the backdrop to what we see here in Matthew 2, verses 13 to 16. The devil trying to kill off the redemption story by destroying Jesus. And Herod is an unwitting part of it all. Herod the Great was an extremely evil man who killed time and again. He even killed his own family. Three of his kids, his wife and his mother-in-law. Time and again he killed to get power, to keep power, and protect his legacy. And the devil used this to make Herod a tool to kill the real king, Jesus, at his birth, to stop redemption in its tracks. So Herod, we read, was furious that the wise men we looked at last week didn't come back to him so he could worship the newborn king. He orders the killing of every boy under the age of two. But despite what the devil wanted, God was never going to allow the redemption story to be killed off at birth. God is in control, and God is unstoppable. So we read in verse 12. Look at verse 12. But having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, the wise men returned to their country by another route. God, the unseen player, orchestrating everything. And throughout these verses, we see God continued intervention to make sure that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were protected. Look at verse 13. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother. Escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Look at verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Look at the second part of verse 22. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the, the, the district of Galilee. The common, view, the common thread here is obvious. God is orchestrating all that's going on with Joseph through dreams. And of course, we saw earlier in, in the Christmas services, Matthew 1, 20-21. It says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him, Joseph, in a dream and told him to marry Mary. God's direct involvement in the Christmas story 
is so clear. And not just with Joseph. In Luke's Gospel, we read that God spoke directly through an angel to Zechariah, the husband of Mary's cousin Elizabeth, and told him that they were going to have a son, John. And this John, of course, was the one who later publicly identified Jesus as the Messiah. We also read in Luke that God spoke through an angel, Gabriel, to Mary about giving birth to a son. And in Luke we see God spoke through a great company of angels to the shepherds. To the Magi, God worked in their hearts, gave them a star to follow, and then spoke to them in a dream, so they wouldn't go back to Herod. And with Joseph, again and again, God spoke to him, spoke to him in dreams. So God involved, intervening, steering things. But let's be clear, none of, the, of what we read in today's passage was God just reacting to a situation on the spur of a moment. It wasn't the case of Herod being nasty, so God thought he'd better do something to get things back on track or keep things on track. We can say that because a word keeps coming up in Matthew 2, and particularly in this passage. In Matthew 1, 21-22, we see the Isaiah 7 prophecy. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Matthew 2, last week, we read that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. And we see it happen just as Micah, the prophet, told it many centuries, centuries earlier. And the word that keeps cropping up is fulfilled. They happen. Look at verse 15. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Verse 17. What was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Verse 22, 23. Joseph, having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went to the town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he be called a Nazarene. So God had already laid down what he was doing. He already knew what he was going to do. He knew what was going to happen. He wasn't just reacting. The Christ was to be born to a virgin and would be born in Bethlehem. The verse 15 prophecy about Egypt is an interesting one. God gave Joseph a dream to return to Israel. So when they returned to Israel, God the Son came out of Egypt. But the original prophecy given by Hosea referred to Israel. The full quotation from Hosea is, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. See, in the Exodus, God initiated the rescue of Israel, who he referred to as my son. And the rescue of them was Moses, rescued by God because of his love for them. And the Gospel of Matthew was written mainly for a Jewish audience. And these readers would have understood in this, using this quote that Matthew was drawing a parallel. Matthew doesn't say that Hosea had Jesus in mind when Hosea 11 1 was originally written. But he's showing that the experience of Jesus matched what Hosea had written about Israel. And that Jesus completed what began with the Exodus, connecting Jesus with the promise of Abraham and the leadership of Moses. That's what Matthew was trying to show the Jewish readers. It's all being fulfilled, this time to completion. And the second prophecy in verse 17, Matthew says that what is fulfilled is that oh, that's Rachel weeping for her children. See, Rachel, if you remember, was Jacob's wife and was known to the rabbis and the mother of Israel for all time. She was buried at Ramah near Bethlehem. And when the Babylonians came and took the people into exile, they built a prison of war camp. Guess where? Ramah. And it was an interim stop for them before they shipped out to Babylon. So Rachel was buried at Ramah, and Rachel's tomb looked over this distressing scene when her people were being forced out of their country and all the death and pain and families torn apart. And now there's the forced exile of Jesus and the ruthless slaughter of all the boys under the age of two. Matthew gives us this picture of Rachel 
and by extension the mothers of those innocent boys in anguish and grieving. It was fulfilled with the forced exodus, and now Matthew says it's been fulfilled to completion in what's happening here in chapter 2. In verse 22 and 23, the third prophecy was that of Jesus being in Nazarene, which presumably equates to someone from Nazareth, but it's not really a commonly used term. His family came, came from there and he was to grow up there, and after a journey via Bethlehem, Egypt, Israel, and eventually Galilee to Nazareth. The devil may want to stop it all, but God's plan, all the minute steps up to Jesus' death, that death on the cross to buy our freedom, it's unstoppable. It's a battle. But we can see that God's in control as we see his plan revealed in the Old Testament by his prophets. And this should give us comfort and assurance, but should also keep us on our guard. Coming back to Revelation 12, John has given the vision that because the devil is stopping his attempt to kill the child, we see in verse 17, that he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. That's us. So we face temptation, doubts and the like, and we need to keep our eye out for these things happening to us and get those eyes firmly fixed on Jesus and the victory that he has already won. We must be careful not to lose sight of what's really happening and become inward looking. To put the focus on ourselves by having a pity party, thinking that we're weak, undisciplined, not committed enough, maybe failures, and not just good enough to belong to Christ. And it's a hard life. I must be doing something wrong. Can Jesus really love me? Has he really saved me? We're in a battle, and we need to take the focus off ourselves and remember that God is in control. Jesus says in John 16, verse 33, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we need to take our eyes off ourselves, stop the woe is me attitude, leave the pity party behind, put our eyes on Jesus and see that he's already won the battle when he died on that cross for us. And remember, he'll be there for us through all the problems and difficulties of life and whatever the devil throws at us. So let's have a look at the third and final picture. The Gospel of Luke focuses on Mary and Nativity, while the Gospel of Matthew focuses on Joseph. And there's a lot we can learn from Joseph's attitude to God. His attitude and actions are incredible, they're absolutely amazing. Think back to Matthew 1, 20 to 21. I'm sure that uh, Mary's condition was scandalous in Nazareth. And we a lot of speculation as to the father. Horrendous for Mary. But she had the angel Gabriel dropping in for a chat. And knew what the, what the situation was and what was going on. Joseph's reputation was on the line here. And his family's too. We're told he was planning to break off the engagement and probably move on with his life, chastened by what had happened. But then the angel appears in a dream and tells Joseph to go and marry Mary. What does he do? Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. It doesn't say that he, he took time thinking about it. He did it straight away. And that's the pattern that we see here in God Speaks through dreams, and Joseph immediately obeys. Verse 14, so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. Verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Verse 23, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. At no point in all of this do we read of Joseph debating with God, or looking for a second, or a third, or a fourth confirmation. Or ignoring the dreams that God has given him, pretending he's maybe had too much cheese before he went to bed. Or saying that God surely couldn't have meant what he'd seen or heard. No. We see there's a man of action who trusts God absolutely. And that's where we should be. 
living and active, trusting and obeying God. So look at the three pictures that seem incredibly important all around Christmas. The first one we need to keep in view is the real Christmas. Not just the cosy components, but including just how God did it all. Never water it down. Always give God the credit. Be amazed by it. Be prepared to share it. And keep that joy in your heart because you know how the story ends. And because of that, we can face life with optimism and hope. The second picture is the one which puts the first picture into context and gives us the why. The first picture happened because God wants it to happen and he's in control. There was a battle then and there's a battle now. And this will continue until Christ comes again and gets rid of the devil once and for all. We will face temptations. But we belong to Christ who's already won the victory. We are Christ's. And we're told that no one can snatch us out of his safe, loving, caring hands. But just remember, we've also been given the full arm of God explained in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. If you don't know that, go and look at Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 when you get home. It protects us. Put it on and be ready for the battle that is raging all around us. And the third important picture is that of the right attitude to God. Obedience. God mightn't speak to us in dreams. Oh, he can do. Um, we can see that with many Muslims. God speaks to them in dreams and they come to faith. Maybe he does speak to you in dreams. But he's given us his word also for us to live our lives by. And the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to strengthen us, and to protect us through our understanding. If we're living for God, we should be living a life that's obedient and active like Joseph. And how do we beat the post-Christmas blues and the struggles of life? Be like Mary and treasure in your heart the wonder of Christmas. All the events, how it happened and why it happened. Treasure the amazing words of the Bible God has given you because he loves you so much. Treasure the one of Easter and Christ's sacrifice for you. And be thankful for your salvation. And remember that the Holy Spirit lives in you because God loves you so much. Then you can live your life with optimism and hope, no matter what's thrown at you. A happy and blessed and continuing Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you can look at these three pictures and look at the amazing fact that you love us so much and that your plan is never going to be thwarted that you are in control at all times. Thank you, Lord, that Matthew recorded that so we could see it. And we thank you to you, Lord, for the obedience of Joseph, time and time again, listening to you and acting. We pray, Lord, that that would be our attitude. We pray, Lord, that we would do that. That we wouldn't get sucked into debating or, or arguing or doubting, but that we would trust you we thank you for the amazing love that you show us. And pray, Lord, that we would live for you as you want us to. And glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your work is alive to all the